into uh, today's study. We finished, we were uh, partway into chapter 5 last week, and I just want to kind of go back and, and summarize uh, uh, the dialogue between Moses and Aaron with Pharaoh begins in chapter 5 and verse 1, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go. First time we hear this, let my people go proclamation. We, we picture Charlton Heston standing there before Yul Brenner. Okay. <laughs> We know Cecil B. DeMille wrote this particular part of the Bible. <laughs> he is the author of it, and everybody's image of this entire encounter is played out clearly with Charlton Heston, bronze and wonderful. Who was Aaron? You know, now that I think about it, Aaron was just a, what was he, like a walk-on player? <laughs> Charlton Heston, Moses gets all the glory. Edward G. Robinson, the guy that, no, he was, he was, uh, he was Judas Iscariot. <laughs> no, he was, uh, yeah, it was, all I know is that Charlton Heston got all the glory. Okay? Isn't that the case? Isn't that always the case? Okay. So we have this encounter between Charlton Heston and Yul Brenner, okay, before he was the king and I. Right before he was the king of Siam, he was Pharaoh. Okay? You see, this is the progression. You go from Pharaoh to become the king of Siam. Okay? According to Cecil B. DeMille. So he says, Let my people go that they may celebrate a festival for me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should heed him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. And they answered, The God of the Hebrews has manifest himself to us. Let us go, we pray, a distance of three days. Now remember, this is three days out, three days back, one day to worship. Seven days. So they're asking for a week off of work. Right? I read someplace where um, a three-day journey was sort of a euphemism for, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> Mark that down. If Alan's ever telling me he's going, <laughs> he's going to be out of, out of town for three days, make sure we ask him, does that mean you're not coming back? Okay, that's Beckman, B-E-C-K-M-A-N. Thank you. All right. Duly noted, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. A little color commentary there. <laughs> but this was the, the uh, if we take a look at this, everybody reads this as a three-day journey, but we don't think of it in the context of three days out. Three days back, one day to worship. Right? This is the pattern of God in the creation and the day of the week, and so they're looking for a Shabbat. Right? They're looking for a Shabbat, right? a day to worship the Lord. Not a morning and an evening, not an evening and a morning. Three days out, three days back, right? six-day journey uh, into the wilderness to sacrifice to the Lord. Now catch this. Lest he strike us with pestilence or sword. Why say that? Is he presenting them that if we don't do this, God's going to kill us? Or is he laying the foundation that this God is so powerful that what happens to Pharaoh in the end? Pestilence and sword. So is he introducing to the concept that if you don't allow this to happen, we're going to tell you, and, and how many of us have done this in our discussions? We have a, uh, well, I'll just put it in terms. You go to a psychiatrist and you tell him you have a friend. Okay. <laughs> Who's got a problem? <laughs> right? I got a friend with a problem. Doc, I just wanted to, you know, get some, to get some counsel. But he's laying the foundation here that, that I, if I put it on myself, right, if I introduce it as something, and when I preach to you and I talk about things uh, in reference to me and my life, am I really just exposing myself and, and, and giving you insight? In no, I'm trying to let you know that I'm just as human as you to relate to it. But if I talk about you, I, you're going to start feeling not convicted, but condemned. And condemnation is not God. Condemnation is the enemy. Conviction is God. Condemnation is the enemy. Completely different concepts. Now, if this, in sharing this about what might happen to him, convicts Pharaoh, 
and he identifies with it and he relates to it, then he's motivated to respond in a particular way. But if it doesn't witness to him, he's going to ignore it. Okay? So, you know, what do I care about you that you're going to get pestilence and sword? You know, I don't care about you. But he's really trying to open up the door to say, hey, Pharaoh, you're wise and powerful. Think about it. If he's going to do this to us, if we don't, do the, if we don't go where he wants us to go, what might he do to you if you don't let us go? This is true benevolence of the Lord. Even in the, in, the, in the particular wording that the Lord uses, He gives us this image that He really wants all of mankind, including Pharaoh and all the Pharaohs, to <laughs> come into the kingdom. It's like Diane and the praise team, Diane and the Dinettes. <laughs> <laughs> but in this concept, we're seeing the benevolent graciousness of God to open up the door that says, you know what, if, in fact, you can relate to this. You've already said you don't know me. But if through this you get an understanding and say, wow, if he's this powerful, he's more powerful than our gods. We've got 80 of them. Okay? You have one and he can do all this. We've got 80. And we can't get them all to agree on anything. <laughs> but you've got one and he can do all this. But it didn't happen. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you distract the people from their task? Get to your labors. And Pharaoh continued, the people of the land are already so numerous, and you would have them cease from their labors. Second time we see the reference to you're too numerous. Now when we established the first time that we heard this reference to the Jewish people becoming too numerous, we identified it as one concept, fear. Fear opened the door to anti-Semitism, that, that what we need to do is we need to get rid of them. We need to control them. We need to cut their, their, their population. We need to get rid of the males. We need to deal with these people. He still harbors this feeling. So it hasn't gone away. As a matter of fact, it becomes more amplified through the course of time. That same day, Pharaoh charged the taskmasters and forgot, or informant of the people, saying, You shall no longer provide the people with straw. For making bricks is heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But impose upon them the same quota of bricks as they have been making heretofore. Do not reduce it, for they are shirkers. This is what they cry Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid upon the men. Let them keep at it and do not pay attention to deceitful promises. Now, as we fast forward and we look at the New Covenant scriptures, Yeshua tells us exactly about this scenario. He says, If you are persecuted, because of me. If you take a beating, as a slave, if you take a punishment for something you did, then you've received your just punishment. But if you take a punishment on my behalf, and you say nothing, you keep your mouth shut, then great will be your reward in the kingdom of heaven. Again, we see the foundation of that right here. People wanted to be punished because of the Lord and to take their punishment. This was severe. They said, let us go to sacrifice to our God, and he heaps punishment upon them. So the taskmasters and foremen of the people went out and said to the people, thus says Pharaoh, catch it. First encounter with Moses and Aaron before Pharaoh, what did they say? Thus says the Lord. This is that mockery. This is that counterfeit. And we see the introduction to this complete counterfeit. Who, who are we really seeing the images of here? We're seeing Yeshua and Satan. When we look at Satan and the description of Satan, what do we hear him described as? He's a counterfeiter. There's going to be people in the pulpit who say they're preaching the gospel, but they're preaching lies. How many of you can identify right now, not, and not that I'm anti-denomination, but there are denominations, there are parts of the body of Messiah that preach that Israel is no longer the apple of God's eye, that the church has replaced Israel, and that they are now Israel. So 100 million people hear that every single Sunday. It's a foundational doctrine of major mainstream denominations in the world. Now, we, we see 
the story of the wheat and the tares. And we know that there's going to be false prophets. We know there's going to be people in the world, well-respected people in the world, who are counterfeiters. We're going to see people that call themselves believers, call themselves Christians, snake oil, smoke and mirrors. And we see the complete pattern of it laid out. You know, is this a story of a one-time event that took place over the course of six or seven months as the petition between Moses and Aaron and Pharaoh, or is this laying the foundation for what's going to happen in the end times and how we're supposed to recognize? Because there's things happening here. There's conversations happening here. There's things taking place here that are the pattern for exactly what's going on today. You know, we got invited to an event with TBN. Uh, this past week to, to um, uh, pre preview, I guess, preview a, a movie that's coming out in January to kind of garner our support for the movie. And uh, it's a great story. It's called The Preacher's Daughter. The Preacher's Daughter? Preacher's Kid? Preacher's, yeah, PK, The Preacher's, Preacher's Kid. And it's a story of, of the prodigal son, the prodigal daughter. Uh, and it's very well done, and it's great. But one of the issues that I've had, and Gary Hodges is a station manager in Gadsden, a fine man, outstanding individual, I've been with them for 25 years, is some of the people that they have on, okay, to me, are, you know, send me some money and God will bless you. You know, and when you really dig into what kind of work are they doing, they're, send me some money and God will bless you. And well, well, where are people's lives getting changed? And where's that? Send me some money and God will bless you. Okay? Well, if, uh, wh where's the fruit? Okay? If it's all about sending you money and this is prosperity sowing, and I believe in prosperity, I don't believe that, that we need to suffer. I don't believe in taking a vow of poverty. Nothing in my Jewish theology that says that I have to starve for the Lord. You know, uh, it just doesn't make sense. You know, I have to be willing to leave behind everything, and, and we've been tested, and we left behind everything. And so we've been shown to be that we were willing to do what we were asked to do, and it didn't mean anything to us, and so we left it behind. It doesn't mean that I have to go live on the street, to demonstrate the fact that I left it behind, he got us a house here, you know, as opposed to the house there. Uh, in all this, there's going to be these things that happen in the end times. And with the media the way it is, we have to be careful. We just have to be careful. Now, does that mean that everybody that's on television is bad? Absolutely not. Does it mean we have to test everything they say? Absolutely. You need to test everything I say. And if you don't, and it proves out that I'm wrong, ultimately, where does that responsibility lie? I told you every single time I talked to you to test it. Test it against the Word of God. Don't take my word for it. Take His word for it. If it doesn't line up with the Word of God, if we can't back it up with Scripture, if what I'm telling you cannot be backed up in Scripture, and as I take you and fast forward you from Exodus into the book of Acts, or Exodus into Ephesians, or Exodus into Philippians, or Exodus into Revelation, because I will tell you that the book of Exodus is the forerunner to the book of Revelation. If you cut out all the in-between books, and all you had was Genesis, Exodus, and Revelation, you would have the entire story of the Lamb of God, his plan on earth and his plan for the kingdom of heaven. Complete. Absolutely complete. With 91 particular references to the Lamb in the book of Revelation. More references to, to the Lamb in the book of Revelation than you have in the book of Exodus. The Lamb plays a bigger role in Revelation in the end and in the restoration of the kingdom than he did in the beginning. It's really an amazing thing when you connect the dots, when you pull all this together. So if the Bible went from Exodus to Revelation, it wouldn't be a leap for me. It would just be a continuation. Yes, Pete. Uh, yes. Okay. 
circumcision that which outward of the flesh. But he is a Jew who is born inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit, mm -hmm. by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. So it would be better said that Paul was referring to individuals and not to race. In other words, that the person who is of, of the Jewish race, if they refuse to believe in Messiah, then they um, are not, when they're outside of well, here, here's, here's the, vision, the visual that I always have, okay? You have the olive tree, okay? The olive tree, that's Israel and the Jewish roots, okay? It's one and the same. This is this trunk, and it's going there, okay? Now, natural branches. What's a natural branch? Natural branch is, is who, who would be a natural branch? Would I be a natural branch? I grew up in a non-believing Jewish home. I came to accept my Messiah. What am I? I'm a grafted in natural branch. I'm put back on the tree. I'm put back on the tree. <laughs> Take a look at the description of the tree. Okay? You have the wild branches grafted in. You have the natural branches grafted in. Grafted back in. Israel. The Jewish people. Okay? What happens? Do I, can I not have a tree growing up and the, and the branches cut off? What happens when the branches are cut off? If it doesn't bear fruit, it's cut off and thrown in the fire. Okay, so the original... Tree is Israel. That's right. Okay, Messiah, Messiah comes. Messiah comes. What happens? All the branches are cut off. All the branches are cut off. Hard to say. Right? All the branches mm -hmm. are cut off. There you go. Who's the wild branch? Who's the wild branch? Gentiles. Gentile believers. The wild branch. Okay? Doesn't mean they're on opposite sides of the tree. See, we always look at this picture and we think, okay, here's this square tree, and on the right side of the grafted in wild branches, and on the left side, what a bunch of junk. Okay? Tree's round. Okay? Okay? Now, as you drive through Israel, what would I tell people out the window as we looked on the Arab side of Israel, I would say, and here's where they have the fence, where they grow fence posts. <laughs> because their vineyards were all planted and the fence posts were up, but they were all dead. So all you saw were these perfect rows of posts. And it looked like that's what they were growing because all the vegetation was dead. Yes? Tree is Israel. And tree is Israel. Okay? You, we're, we're praying for the restoration of Israel. What does that mean? <coughs> Physical restoration and spiritual restoration. It's a two-part restoration. If you take a look on our website, we believe, as a, as a congregation, one of our tenets is that we believe in the restoration of Israel, both the physical restoration and the spiritual restoration. What does that mean? That this tree must blossom again. This tree must bloom again. And when the fig tree blossoms, all right, so which branch of the fig tree is blossoming? All of them. When the tree blossoms, can, the wild branch is blossoming, the natural branch is blossoming. I'm a natural branch grafted back into my own tree. As a non-believer, 42 years, unbelief. Didn't believe in the Messiah, didn't know about the Messiah. Okay, so where was I on that tree? Well, I was really underground. I had my roots in there. Okay? I was underground. You know, my roots were underground. I was buried, okay? along with my dead ancestors and everybody else. I was under the ground. Okay? But when life came, I was grafted back into my own tree. What does that mean? In order for us to be one in Messiah on equal standing, Okay. If a natural branch is growing on the tree and a branch is grafted in, that might say that, well, this one has more preference than the other. But if I'm grafted in and you're grafted in, okay, I happen to be a natural branch grafted in. You happen to be a wild branch grafted in. Okay. But the point is, is not whether we're our origin, but the fact is, is how do we get back on the tree? We're both grafted back in. Okay. We have equal footing and equal status in that, that we become one in Messiah. In order to have this whole concept that God lays out for us of embracing differences, is we have to recognize the fact that Jews are Jews and Gentiles are Gentiles. Okay? It's important. Men are men and women are women. 
And so when he says, well, you know, in the, in, 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 in the spirit, okay, there is, there's no longer Jew and Gentile, you know, Greek and, uh, you know, Jew and Greek and male and female and black and white and pink and orange and all this other stuff. The point is, is that when I look around this room, there's men and women and there's black and white and there's differences. And we are to look at these differences and we're to say, what is the calling? There's communities I can't go into. I can go into them, but not going to be received. There's communities you will go into, and you will not be received. Why does God do this? Because we enter into kingdoms and into places where we will be received, where we can have the most power. I can't relate. When somebody comes to me and they say to me, I have terminal cancer, I cannot say to them, I know how you feel. I don't have terminal cancer. I can offer them sympathy, but I cannot offer them empathy. I can't relate to their situation. I can try to give comfort. But what am I going to do? I'm going to bring the person in that was diagnosed with terminal cancer and was healed, and then I'm going to bring somebody in who had a loved one die of cancer. And both of them are going to minister to this person through the fact that this is where they'll be better received. I talk that language. When somebody said to me, you know, I'm on this particular drug therapy. I don't know what that is. I'm sorry. To me, chemotherapy is like most of our understanding of chemotherapy. Your hair falls out. Okay? Maybe it doesn't. I'm not well enough informed about it okay, to really be able to talk to somebody. But if you've been through that therapy and you understand that regimen, I want to plug you into that person so you can talk about what we just talked about, like Rowena with her hip. We have other people here of hip, and I've been through some hip replacements with some people in this congregation, and so I know about that. But if I'm going to really use things in the kingdom, I'm going to take a Rowena that went through this, and I'm going to say, this is now part of your ministry. If God's really going to use you through this, then what your expectation and anticipation was prior to this because you think you had the power and the, and the strength and all this, the moral character, and, the, and you were a, a, a type D driver personality, type A personality, and you're going to go through all this, and you're going to make it through with no bumps in the road, what kind of counsel would you give to the next person that felt that way? You'd probably say to them, whoa, okay? You need to become more aware. These are the questions, had I known to ask, I would have asked before. Well, that's what ministries are made of. People who have been through these things that can now connect and relate. Does that mean that she's better than me? Or that I'm a less than her? We're different. We have different experiences. Unless we identify those different experiences, we can't minister. There have to be differences. There must be differences. We must have different experiences. Everybody doesn't have... We all have the same fruit... We all do not have the same gift. It says, to some, I give this gift. And to others, I give this gift. Well, doesn't that mean that we're different? It says, don't be envious of this gift. Yes, Don. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's, that's what ministry is made of. If you have a hard, rough experience, you lost your home, you lived in the street. Look, I lived in the street. You want me to talk to a homeless person about what God can do in your life? Talk to me. Talk to others that have been through it and are out the, on the other side of it. Now, I know people who live on the street that that is their ministry. They don't want off the street because they feel that in the comfort of their home, they cannot minister to people that are going through a difficult time. They don't feel they'll be received unless they're in the trenches with them. They have the means. We read in the paper all the time about a homeless person leaves $100,000 to the ASPCA. Or a homeless person leaves, leaves an estate of $900,000 to three favorite charities. You know, but that person lived in the street because that's where they could minister. It's how God operates. Why did he send Moses back into Pharaoh? Because he would be received. Because he knew Pharaoh's house. He knew the operation. 
He knew what was going on. He knew the lifestyle. He knew the language. He knew the lingo. He knew their gods. He knew what. When God said, I'm going to bring frogs, he knew that the frog was the god of fertility in Egypt. When he said he's going to turn the water into blood, he knew that they had a god that was the god of the Nile. And this was one of their gods, and one of these gods would be knocked down, and another god would be knocked down, and he could relate to that. And God equipped him so that when he spoke of these things, it would be received. A total stranger from out of town couldn't even get an appointment with Pharaoh. So when we look at this situation of how we can relate to each other, why did, why did God send a Messianic Jewish rabbi here to Birmingham? There are others in this community that have a Messianic calling, a Messianic heart, but they're not a Jewish rabbi. And so what's been the difference in 25 years between the growth and the acceptance? And the, because God chose somebody that people would be received. I'm received in the Jewish community. I'm received in the non-Jewish community. We have favor in places that others have not had favor before. Does that mean that they were the wrong people or they didn't do a good job? They did a great job. They're the ones that plowed the concrete for us to be able to come here. They're the ones that tore down the barriers and the walls. Were they the wrong people? I'll never say that they were the wrong people. God has chosen to give us supernatural favor. But I'm able to be received because I have the, the Jewish upbringing in the Jewish community, in the Jewish home, and I have the Messianic. I don't have the church. So when I bring thought to a church, it's a new concept. Some of you were out with us, and, and uh, uh, Judy and, and David got us out to um, uh, Mount Vernon, Gardendale, Mount Vernon, United Methodist Church, and we have a great relationship with the people out there. We're going to be back doing a Passover Seder for them, and I don't typically do Passover Seders in private churches because we do the big community one. So we've really pushed back from doing the 20 or 30 that we've done in the past to doing just a small handful and really just doing the big citywide one because we want the big push to be the central focus where it brings unity in the body. But we came out there and, and preached on Pentecost and brought concepts into a United Methodist Church that were fairly revolutionary. It was a Pentecostal, you know, they have, we have all these labels. I don't really understand what they all mean. I just know the words. <laughs> but it was a Pentecostal, charismatic, spirit-filled Jewish message about, <laughs> you know. Okay, okay, I understand one out of four. <laughs> Right. But it came time at the end where the pastor opened up the floor for questions, and I was asked the question about speaking in tongues. And I looked at the pastor, and I said, Pastor, this is your, this is your flock. I will not speak on this unless you tell me it's okay to speak. He goes, speak. All the walls are knocked down now. <laughs> That's it. We call that a sacred cow tipping moment. You know, so we were able to make a tremendous breakthrough. And in fact, you know, I think that there are things that have continued to happen. And we've met with, with uh, Pastor Jerry Hunt out there several times. And she's talking about the excitement and the enthusiasm and the embracing of more. And she's teaching in Exodus. She taught in Genesis when we were in Genesis. Uh, she did it about a year faster than we did. <laughs> uh, but, you know, these are parallels. And she continues to send me questions throughout her teachings to say, well, what's the Jewish thought on this? And, you know, why this? And how come this period of time? And what was the real thinking here? To make sure that they're embracing the real foundation because they're now gone from what I would call a pretty mainstream United Methodist work to being a more provocative, spirit-filled, embracing the Word of God. And that's a lot to do with the fact that we have people who come here from other congregations that continue to bring this message to break down walls where we can be received. And so that's because they were a part of that congregation that they could bring me there. If I had just knocked on their door, they'd say, you're a what? <laughs> and you want to do what? And now we have an annual event with them, the same way we have an annual event here with Mountain Chapel, that they're so excited about, they're planning it six months in advance. That's how excited they are. They want to know every aspect of it, and they want you to come and enjoy it with them. And they're really looking at this as something that brings healing to the body. 
So Moses was sent because Moses would be received. You've been sent because you'll be received. And sometimes it's for you to go before us to prepare the way. Many times you hear me pray and I ask the Lord to go before us and prepare the way because his word says he will prepare the way for us to be received. You know, supernatural favor or, or grace is unmerited favor in the definition of what we call grace. But truly the merited favor becomes when you call upon the name of the Lord to recognize the fact that he can go before you and prepare the way. And then man calls it, wow, he's got so much favor. Well, in God's order, you send him first. You're going to have favor. You go first and then try to get the Lord to come in behind you and clean up. You know, same thing, clean up on aisle six. <laughs> Happens all the time. So now we have this counterfeiter. And this counterfeiter says, thus says Pharaoh. And we see that what's done in the name of the Lord is now being done in a counterfeit way. Is it mockery? Not intended to be mockery, but that's how it's, it's subtle. Okay? Many of us have read this passage, never really thought about the wording. But now when we really look at the wording, what's he saying? He's saying that in his mind, these are the people, these are the foremen, the taskmasters and the foremen go out and say to the people, thus say Pharaoh. Pharaoh is God to them. He is God to them. He has the power of life and death in his hands. And we talked about that. And we have to understand. Now, in our economy, the president isn't God. <coughs> he doesn't have the power of life and death in his hands. He has the power, he has the power to commute a death sentence, but he's not a judge. He can't tell the Supreme Court to vote this way. The United States Constitution does not give him the power to dictate decisions like that. He can appoint to the Supreme Court with the confirmation of Congress. But he is not, they don't go for advice and consent on judicial matters for him to say, well, how do you want us to vote? Maybe that goes on. Okay. But we have separation between the branches of government. And it's the same separation that we embrace between the separation of a church and state. So thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you any straw. You must go and get the straw yourselves wherever you can find it, but there shall be no decrease wherever, where, whatever in your work. Then the people scattered throughout the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. And the taskmasters pressed them, saying, You must complete the same work assignment each day as when you had straw. And the foremen of the Israelites, whom Pharaoh's taskmaster had set over them, were beaten. Why, they were asked, did you not complete the prescribed amount of bricks, either yesterday or today, as you did before? Then the foremen of the Israelites came to fire and cried, Why do you deal thus with your servants? No straw is issued to your servants, yet they demand of us. Make bricks, thus your servants are being beaten when the fault is with your own people. And he replied, you're shirkers, shirkers. This is why you say, let us go and sacrifice the Lord. Be off now to your work. No straw shall be issued to you, but you must produce your quota of bricks. Now the foremen of the Israelites found themselves in trouble because of the order. You must not reduce your daily quantities of bricks. As they left Pharaoh's presence, they came upon Moses and Aaron standing in their path. And they said to them, may the Lord look upon you and punish you for making us loathsome to Pharaoh and his courtiers, putting a sword in their hands to slay us. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why do you bring harm upon this people? Why did you send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has dealt worse with this people, and still you have not delivered your people. Huge, huge transaction taking place here. The grumbling and complaining we see after the children of Israel cross into cross the river on their journey into the promised land, this exact same dialogue that Moses just had with the Lord is had with Moses. Remember what they said to them. We were better off in Egypt. Why did you do this to us? Remember we talked about, not I, I, I tend not to call it divine retribution, but in God's balance, 
the concept we have in, in modern times, what goes around comes around. And then we see it in Scripture that says, Judge not, lest you be judged. By the same measure you judge another, so you will be judged. By the same measure. Moses went before the Lord and spoke these words, and then all of a sudden, not much longer, the exact same words are being brought back to Moses. How many of you have ever heard your own words used against you? Don't you hate it? The kids, kids always use your own words against you. You watch your kids playing, and you hear one of them say, Get out of the way, you stupid so and so. And you run out there and go, Where did you hear that? From you, mommy. We were in the back seat of the car, mommy. We heard you say that to that person in front of you. Yeshua told us the pattern. He said, I don't say anything I didn't hear my father say. I don't do anything I didn't see my father do. I'm here about my father's business. This is where I learned this behavior. We see this pattern right here. We saw it with Abraham. We saw it with Isaac. We saw it with Jacob and the boys. We see it here again with Moses. God's showing us things in the word. What we sow is what we reap. How many of you have gardens? How many of you planted tomatoes and six weeks later went out there and stomped your foot and said, I was expecting peaches. <laughs> That's the kind of foolishness we portray when we sow something and then we're upset because we got something else. You planted tomatoes. What did you expect? Is this not human nature? Now, I can understand going out and I say, wow, tomatoes. I forgot I planted those. That'd be me. Oh, hey, look at that. Tomatoes are growing wild in our yard. That would... Right. That would be much more like me. Right. And wow, they're growing in a perfect row. And they have those little metal things on them. Wow. But as far as expecting peaches and, being, and then being disappointed. And say, a peach tastes like a tomato. But this is the nature of man. We forget what we sowed in the ground. You know, God gives us so many agricultural pictures. We plant a seed in the ground, and then over a period of time, it then comes up. Now, if we leave that field for long enough, we may have forgotten what we planted. And we're surprised when we come back, and it's full of stuff. Or we don't weed for a while, and the weeds take over. You know, God tells us in Deuteronomy, don't... Plant a field with mixed seeds. You'll defile, the, you'll defile the fruit. You'll defile the field. And you can't separate wheat from oranges or wheat from, yeah, onions from lettuce. Ew. You know? But these things happen. But we do this. We do this when we're inconsistent. We do this when we... When we, we Plant these ways, and, and uh, uh, it's exactly what happens. So Moses has these same words come back on him. And this is the whole cycle all over again. So in chapter 6, Then the Lord said to Moses, You shall soon see what I will do to Pharaoh. He shall let them go because of a greater might. Indeed, because of a greater might, he shall drive them from his land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. Has he not already told him that? He's now revisiting this to remind him. Now imagine, you go into a place like Pharaoh's palace, surrounded by guards, by wealth, by all this power. It's easy to see, and somebody rejects you and then heaps all kinds of worry on you, that he really does have the power 
and the authority to bring havoc to your life. You've got the people grumbling and complaining. It's easy to lose sight of the fact that you're there on a divine mission from the Lord. Easy to get distracted. Easy to get discouraged. So God knows this. He knows the nature of man. Yes? Uh, in the chapter before, though, it says that the Lord told Moses ahead of time, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart, and I'm not going to let, he's not going to let the people go. And here, Moses, I mean, I know it's because of the people coming out against mm -hmm. him, but now he just says, you know, whine. If he had prepared the people, mm -hmm. maybe they'd still be mad, but they would still know that he's not gonna he's not gonna let us go. God has a plan and he's not gonna let he's not gonna let us go for a while. What happens in a congregation when you plant seeds of discord? Plant a perfect garden and plant one seed of a weed, what happens to your garden? Take over. Unless you root it out real quick. It chokes it. It's like a parasite. What's that one that grows on the ground? Kudzu. It's a parasite? Daughter? Oh, not like D-A-U-G-H-T-E-R. Okay. I was thinking if you're having problems with your daughter, it's not really not the place to bring it out. And You know, we can talk offline. I know she's an artist and everything and kind of difficult to handle, but, you know, Paul, it's just really not the time to call her a parasite. <laughs> but if you have one thing that's going to take over, that's what seeds of discord do. You know, I have a saying that says seeds... Uh, seeds of doubt grow into weeds of the soul. And that's what happens. It takes over. It chokes the life out. And that's what a weed does. It chokes the life out of, out of life. It chokes the life out of vegetation and things that were planted for production. But if you let it go too far, it will take over your garden and it will choke out the life of all the fruit. This is what happens in congregations. Seeds of discord are planted. So here's what happens. It's easy to get caught up. Mob mentality. People start grumbling and complaining. The weak get caught up in it. And was Moses a strong leader? We know that Moses was impetuous. Okay? We see a lot of individual acts of Moses, but we have yet to see him lead a large group of people. So we don't know him yet as a leader. He doesn't know himself as a leader. That's correct. 